Welcome all. Welcome to today's seminar, the scenarios to unlock a brighter future, 200% renewable energy for Australia. First, let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and the elders past and present. It's a great pleasure today to have um, Dylan and Chang presenting what the Energy Transition Hub um, has been working on with many modelers over the last two years. Um, we have modelers in the room here from Monash University, Roger, uh, who has been involved, um, Falko Uckert from the Potsdam Institute for um, Climate Impact Research and many others, and really trying to nail down what it means for the electricity sector if you go for an Australia renewable energy superpower uh, vision. And there's so much moral re there's so many moral reasons why we could think that um, Australia should reduce its emissions, um, but there's also a very appealing economic reason why unlocking a future where you export renewable energy, you attract energy intensive industries is a tremendous job and economic motor for Australia. And it's a political agenda that both sides of government could adopt. It's a agenda that fits, happens to fit in the UK very well with the Tories. Um, and really, as an economic motor, it fits in Germany very well with the Conservatives as a technology and innovation agenda, etc. So here is the mineral rich Australia with where the dimmest place is as bright as the uh, sunniest place in Germany. Um, and that is a tremendous opportunity. And I'm really thankful for here, Dylan and Chang now drilling down into these results. You will see here slides by Malta Mindsausen that is a bit uh, misleading because actually all the results are from Dylan and Chang and Falco and Roger and the others. I was just putting the lipstick on. So um, <laughs> without further ado, over to you. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Malta. <laughs> yeah, I guess I should start by um, also acknowledging all the, uh, all the plenty, you know, the 20 uh, odd researchers that were involved in um, all the work that uh, went into this. I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. And um, I guess we're in a somewhat um, fortunate uh, position for those that are, um, who saw uh, or heard um, uh, Anthony Albanese's speech um, in Perth yesterday. He essentially recast their climate policy in terms of the economic opportunities for Australia and, the, and, and particularly around uh, the jobs. So by uh, luck rather than good planning, we are very much uh, talking along those, uh, along similar uh, ideas today. Um, yeah, just a quick, uh, on, on today's presentation, I'm, I'm gonna talk about some yeah, quick, quick um, context, some of the basic ideas. Chang's gonna go into the, the model setup uh, and some of the assumptions and um, uh, you know, um, various scenarios that we looked at, then we'll come back. I'll come back and talk a bit more about the the results at the end, and then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions because I'm sure sure there'll be many. So, 
Um, yeah, no surprises to anyone here. This is all in the context of a, a very significant need to decarbonise uh, the global economy. Um, and, you know, there's, there's you know, a, a whole huge uh, catalogue of work around how quickly and how how significant this task is ahead of us, and this is very much informing, has informed the, the genesis of this work, and and uh, it, you know both for what Australia needs to do you know, on Malta's principle, you know the moral um, the moral perspective, but also what economic opportunities that um, that does present to Australia. Um, so yeah, just in terms of you know what we are currently doing, um, you know, is this is you know our current NDC, and this is a, you know, well, I think the government likes talking about the twenty six percent target more than the the twenty eight percent target these days. Um, and the the very the very quick answer to that is certainly not. Um, and you know, we're, as we're going through the um, the we'll we'll see this perhaps more um, uh, this will become more apparent as we go through the. The, sec the, the ratcheting mechanism through the Paris Agreement, how, how inadequate adequate our targets actually are, particularly in the face of, um, 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 you know, that, that deep decarbonisation task that we, we really do have in front of us and the significant need to rapidly decarbonise the, the entire economy. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think as is probably uncontroversial to everyone in this room, um, zero emissions electricity is is essentially a very important prerequisite for this process it sort of a, it facilitates decarbonization in the more difficult sectors things like you know transport uh, industrial emissions and so on and and essentially there's there's a need to go much harder faster and um and quicker in the electricity sector um and yeah and as as, as this bottom point um, points out cost of optimal solutions generally have electricity sector doing a lot of the heavy lifting earlier on um, compared to the other sectors. Um, yeah, so to, to, Mal to Malta's um, uh, point, this is often cast as a, you know, what has historically been cast as a, an economic issue versus a moral issue. And um, we had a, a, a statement from our former uh, Prime Minister um, earlier this year where he essentially, he, you know, he said this point in black and white that, you know, when we talk about climate change as an economic issue, we do well, or, or then when it's talked about as a, a moral issue, we do it tough. And, and you know, this is also, um, I mean, this is partly reflected in the, I don't know if it's right to call it a pivot, but a reframing of this, um, of the, the Labor, um, well, it seems to be a re reframing of their, their policy in terms of um, the economic opportunities and jobs. Um, so I guess it's, yeah, you know, in Australia, we, we're good at digging things up. Um, we're good at shipping them overseas. And basically a lot of that, that happens over, over the, uh, you know, on the other side of the, the globe or, you know, in different countries. Um, that's our, uh, you know, very crudely, um, you know, whether it's agriculture or mining. Um, well, I guess now we ship a lot of uh, um, tertiary educated students overseas, but, um, you know, historically at least, um, uh, mining has been our, um, uh, you know, digging things up and selling things has been our, our economy. Um, now, if you look at this in a different light, and this is essentially, you know, the, where, we, where we're coming from this, we're saying, well, okay, instead of, instead of just, just mining and shipping, how about using, you know, combining our, our relative competitive advantage with, of mineral resources and renewable energy resources and doing more processing here, um, and potentially shipping those more processed uh, um, uh, outputs that, to the to the rest of the economy. That's that's you know part of the story here. But you know we have historically had a strategic advantage or competitive advantage in in energy and minerals, uh, and that's in the, the let's say old fossil world where we had lots of lots of coal, lots of gas, and lots of mineral resources. And it's it's essentially it's essentially a reimagining of that scenario, except instead of Instead of we're talking about coal and and um, gas, we're talking about uh, wind and solar, and you know we can still be. The, I mean, you know, we we've notionally called our scenario 200% renewable energy. Um, as as Cheng will talk out talk about later on, it's actually it's actually a lot more than 200% depending on how you you measure it. But if you think about what we do with the coal sector now, um, we currently um, you know I think we export about three times as much coal as we burn in Australia. Well, actually, and if you add gas on top of that, it's a, more, more, a lot more than that again. So we're we're a three hundred percent coal economy right now, and it's not that dramatically different to re to think about 
Australia as a 200% or 500% as a, or 700%, I think we have the arena boss talked about recently as Australia being um, in the future. We are an energy exporting country, we could be in the future. So it's, it's not necessarily that these things are um, in opposition um, and that's, I guess, that's the sort of under, this is where we were coming from when we, we set up this, this uh, sort of initiative, a, a couple of, um, um, yeah, over 12 months, 18 months ago now. Now, what are these sort of options for renewable energy exports? Um, there's, there's, there's many options here, but I'll talk about um, um, three of them I guess, uh, in a bit more detail, just because they're, they're worth uh, thinking about, talk, talking about, um, we have a particular, particular opportunities. Um, so one is direct uh, high voltage DC links to, to um, countries where we basically you know, throw a power line over, over the border to someone else. Um, hydrogen is, is certainly something that's gained a lot of attention and interest in the last, the last 12 to 18 months as well. Um, in that case, we, we, we are effectively exporting our electricity in the form of a carrier, and our hydrogen being the carrier. There's lots of different carriers. Uh, seems to be a lot of interest in liquid organic carriers and that's LA. HC, I think it's liquid organic hydrocarbons and ammonia. They seem to be fairly promising forms of, of uh, basically bottling the sun or bottling the wind, however you want to think about it. Um, and then, they, and you know, that they that is almost a you know a not quite direct, but that that can fit very well into um, uh, the sort of gas export um, uh, narrative and and industries as well. I mean, we have we have countries that you know we already export to. Uh, Japan and South Korea for steel, steel manufacturing, um, and you know they they rely on a lot of our energy. Japan has histor historically, at least, been a very big importer of our um, energy resources, and you know these are the sort of things that um, they may be interested in in a decarbonized, decarbonized world. The other one that's um, I guess particularly it's sort of interesting, essentially from a um, yeah, certainly from the jobs and uh, local manufacturing perspective is it's not so much directly exporting um, the the energy itself but the value added energy so you know uh, aluminium is a, a is has often been described as um, congealed electricity you know in the in the sense that it, it, it is essentially made out of electricity it is you know we, um, you know in, historically in, in Australia we, we have made that we've used our very low cost uh, black and brown coal resources to power aluminium smelters. Um, and that is obviously, you know, not amenable to a, um, a carbon constraint world. And we're actually seeing some of the big major um, uh, aluminium companies around the world looking at, at, at basically rationalizing their assets and their um, investments based on not only, you know, cheap electricity, but also carbon. You know, I think Alcoa is basically doing a, a review of their fleet now and thinking about where they should be um, in the future, where, where they should be doing um, you know, they're aluminium smeltering and I, for one, think Australia should be one of those places, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. But there's also, you know, green steel, there's also a whole heap of other minerals resources that may be quite important in, in the, the transition to a, a low carbon economy. Um, yeah, so I sort of spoke a bit about, that's just a, a um, artist impression of, you know, Actually, shipping, that's a, an important point that um, shipping is actually, I think, last time I checked, it was the sixth largest, if, you, if it was a country, it's the sixth largest emitter. And that's a, a fact that people often miss. And hydrogen, and in, in particular, is, uh, is a, it's a really good option for that particular sector um, because, uh, essentially because um, um, it, if it, it's, it enables bulk transport. It's those long distance kilometers and uh, I guess energy density that you get from, from hydrogen that you don't get with things like lithium ion that uh, make that a particularly attractive um, sort of option. I think one of the, the largest or at least one of the, the largest, Maersk um, has actually announced they're going to be carbon neutral by uh, 2050 and they're doing a lot of work on hydrogen fuel cell powered um, um, shipping at the moment. Um, the other one is HVDC. Um, this is this is one that Chang's done a lot of work on, um, and perhaps we can talk a little bit more about this if, in, if there's time in the questions. I have my reservations with this. I don't necessarily have the same perspective as, as Chang on some of this stuff. There are some definite advantages of this um, in terms of 
you know, it's um, higher efficiency than, than hydrogen. You have a much better round trip efficiency, but there are substantial, in my mind at least, substantial um, political, geopolitical issue, and also local um, political economy issues um, for, for doing this that make, in my mind, this a, a very challenging task. But we can talk about that uh, later on. Um, and yeah, shipping, um, <coughs> yeah, not, not shipping iron ore, but um, or hydrogen as a um, as a you know a separate product to another country to refine, but actually making steel in Australia with hydrogen and then shipping that product to the rest of the country. Um, so yeah, the, the this particular. So from from this we you know we we partnered up with these German groups and there's about um something about 20, 20 odd modelers were involved in this this process. Um, some from DLR, some from PIC, some from yeah, Monash, um, and it's, it's you know it's been a it's been a long long process. And, and I guess the question is, oh yeah, we've got a report if you're interested. Um, um, I guess it's it's worth pointing out. Okay, why 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 Germany? Um, you know, they're, they're very nice people. I have to say that there's a few chance. <laughs> but um, and they're, you know great researchers. But there is actually some. There are strategic reasons that Germany is interested in this, and that we we are, um, are you know as a as a you know two countries. There is some really strong synergies here, particularly well. So they you know Germany's obviously got a very big um, industrial base and manufacturing know-how and technical expertise in a lot of the equipment that's used in in the renewable energy space, but also some of the other industries. Things like flexible aluminium smelting. There's a company in Germany called Trimet that can I think do some really, it's essentially a virtual battery in an aluminium smelter. It's, it's some really interesting stuff. So they, they have sort of, uh, I guess, um, IP and uh, equipment they want to sell us, but they are also less, um, less, let's say, um, uh, yeah, uh, I think the word, no, um, <laughs> I might say that, um, the, they, uh, they have less, they are more constrained in terms of their renewable energy resource than, than Australia, that's for sure. Um, so, you know, if you, I think um, Malta made this point that if you look at, um, oops, if you look at it, the southwestern, the best, the best resource in, in the best solar resource in, um, in Germany is in about, uh, yeah, southern, southern Germany. It's about equivalent to Tasmania in Australia. So we, we have a substantially better um, um, solar resource in Australia. Um, so, yeah, we've got this sort of tooling and know-how that they're interested in, the actual... Um, better resources here and they actually have a huge demand well a theoretically huge demand for things like hydrogen and low carbon products in this transition to a low carbon economy it actually just so happened uh, when we had our symposium a couple of weeks and we found out that the amount of hydrogen we modeled for export happened to almost directly match what their energy requirement might be from hydrogen in um in yeah, I think it was 2050, I can't remember, but it, that was actually not a design. We didn't do that, that we came from a different approach, which um, Chang will talk about, but it just so happened that they're, they're looking at this as, um, you know, they, they're gonna have energy security issues or limitations if they go to this, you know, this decarbonized world. Um, and yeah, just in, in terms of, I guess this is kind of, um, you know, they're, they're further along, we're, we're both going, you know, sort of, um, there's a fair bit of info here. It's basically renewable energy share um, on the on the the bars and the investment in the in the um, the red and the blue lines. Um, so they're further along um, in yeah, further along in I guess the pr proportion of renewable energy um, as as would be no surprise. Um, but our investment has been has been very high in the last couple of years, which is a point that our energy minister likes making it um, a lot of noise about. But we're actually about to have a big we're, well, we have had a huge decline in investment over the last twelve months. Um, so there's no reason that this will continue, and we need essentially we need to think about the right policy frameworks or incentives um, that that make sense for for us to continue to decarbonise. Because as much as you know, this is a great this was great 18 months ago. Um, it's not so great now. Um, and with that, I'll um, hand over to Cheng to talk a bit more about the modelling. Thanks, Dylan. 
she said to mention this massive project is a collaboration, bilateral collaboration between Germany and Australia. And we have four models with one ultimate goal is to derive the cost automobile transition scenarios of Australia's electricity supply until 2050. We have uh, two we have two models from the Australian side and two from the German side. So actually, all these four models is, is different from, uh, is different in terms of scope and type and temporal resolution, spatial resolution, even the char characteristics. For the German model, remind from, from, from the peak, actually it's a global integrated assessment model, which derives which, uh, which derives how the Australian electricity sector would be responsible for uh, if uh, compared to other energy sectors in, uh, in each of our scenarios as a starting point for the other three models to, uh, to find out what the uh, best uh, energy uh, generation mix would be in the future. So, um, OpenSAN use, uses uh, the IEMO um, ISP report using the NTNDP zones with the uh, energy demand nodes. And the remix model is different, but uh, and is performed well in its characteristic with its high detailed model, but it is uh, only model 2050 using a green, uh, using a green field approach. So it, you can see all the four models different. We only synchronize the demand data. So hourly demand data from, from other energy sectors. For the others is all different. And all, each model is determined what energy, I mean, what the uh, technical um, techn technology projection would be in Tulan Fuji from various credible resources. So like uh, Miriam OpenSAM uses the uh, CSRO's uh, cost gen report and the ISP reports, but the remix model uses some of the German studies. So all the models are different and we use a different assumption, we use different uh, source of the uh, data assumptions, but we have one goal to see what the energy system would look like in 2050. So we just use Muriel as an example how we model the whole stuff. So as you can see, this uh, this uh, schematic shows the the, um, the solid li solid line shows the current transmission system. The model is quite uh, detailed. We model the tra existing transmission as well. So the red dot shows where we can connect the electrolysis for green hydrogen production within the national electricity market. Because the location is very important, it's gonna affect how the energy, how the hydrogen would use. If all the electrolysis we found, the, the best location for all the electrolysis located into um, the electricity market in the east seaboard, which means it will promote greater domestic use because it can also inject into the existing gas network. This is of critical importance. Yeah, we also take into account the distance to the uh, closest shipping ports, also the source of uh, water, whether we're going to use the desalinated water or use the surface water. So overall, this optimization model would tell us when and where and what technology to build for transition, uh, sorry, for generation, transmission, and the hydrogen system. So it's really large, uh, complicated uh, optimization model. More details. This is the least cost co-optimization model of generation, transmission, green hydrogen system. For that model, we uh, starting from the existing NAN, National Electricity Market, uh, generation uh, and transmission systems, with also the existing generation fleet and their retirement time. 
So all our hydrogen system in, in the scenario that I will introduce to you is closely aligned with ACL Island's export, export scenarios. So uh, it's in line with other studies as well. So as you can see, um, the transmission model is quite uh, detailed. We have some security constraints as well. As I mentioned, the, uh, the, the technology production cost is from various national reports, although it's different from other, uh, from, from other models. So uh, um, I will, for the next set, I will introduce you our six scenarios from the status quo to a 200% uh, scenarios. There are lots of details. You could remember this detail. You always can just refer to the existing uh, generation from a national electricity market, which is about 200 terawatt hours a year. So the first, for the status quo uh, scenario, we only uh, incorporate existing policies, and there's no emission reduction targets. What, what we want to know from this scenario is what the renewable deployment and emission reduction can be expected without additional policies. So for the power system emissions, we'll assume nothing as you can see. So for the electricity generation sector, we only assume the electricity demand is constant from now to 2050, which is unlikely to happen. There is no electrification from other sectors, and there is no energy export, uh, renewable energy exports. So the second scenario is NDC scenario. So the NDC emission target is, is translated uh, for the power sector and extrapolated until 2050. The emission reduction from the electricity sector is by 50% uh, reduction by 2030 and 60 to 70 reduction by uh, 2050. And the bottom line shows the uh, economy uh, abatement, carbon abatement. So in this one, we, we assume moderate electrification from the industry and the ground transport, like 40%. But for the domestic and commercial heating, we assume 100%. Again, there's no energy export. And we have a more ambitious scenario, the accelerated scenario, which is in line with the Climate Change Authority's proposal. So as you can see, um, the, uh, the emission from the power sector will be almost uh, zero by 2050. So the leadership scenario is even more ambitious, which the energy demand from the electricity for electricity will be three times of the current demand. So in this one, we have a domestic hydrogen here, which is used to deep decarbonize the economy like, uh, like uh, um, aviation and shipping. And we assume 80% carbon reduction from the uh, industry and ground transport. So again, this, this is the export, this is the uh, accelerated plus export scenario. So, so based on the accelerated scenario, we want to uh, export 140 terawatt hours of hydrogen and for 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 export, which is in line with the SA Island's medium scenario. So in total is about 2.5 times of the NAM current generation. So this is actually is our 200 percent renewable. The way we call it 200 percent renewable because the, the reference point is by 2050. If you compare the electricity generation to the current to the current NAM actually is five times. So in this one, what is new, we have domestic, uh, apart from domestic hydrogen, we have 25% of uh, energy intensive products. For example, uh, for uh, green steel, for example. 
and we have 20% of direct electricity for green aluminum production. So this is over four or uh, six scenarios. You may think this is too ambitious, this will never happen. I just get some uh, comments from, from even from well, fam famous experts saying, okay, Australia has such small population, we will never achieve that. But actually, like Dylan said, if you, if you compare your current coal, yeah, if you, if you compare your current coal and LNG export, actually, this is really small number. Just steal a slide from the Australia's chief scientist, Alan Finkel, at the Hydrogen Forum. So at, at the moment, Australia export, LNG export is 17 million tons, which is equivalent to 30 million tons of uh, hydrogen, like five times of the Australian national electricity market generation. Depending on the electrolysis conversion efficiency, like 50%, this will equal to around 2,000 terawatt hours, which is actually eight times, the current LNG export is eight times of the Australian national electric market generation. And if we only produce this amount of energy from solar PV, which is equivalent to this amount of area, and it's like, um, yeah, this is almost like the uh, Anna Creek station in South Australia. It's three uh, a quarter. So using the same analogy, if Australia want to replace its uh, coal export, then this will require another eight times. If Australia want to export, you know, uh, in terms of green uh, steel rather than I know the energy requires another eight times, then in total it's around 20 times. This is how, this is what Australia actually exporting to the rest of the world. So the next deal will tell you which um, scenario will deliver a better result for Australia. Thanks, Jing. Oops. Okay, so there's a lot, oops, is this one? Yep. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on in this, this slide. So this is essentially um, comparing the results of those four, uh, four plus two scenarios. So basically four scenarios plus with two of those having export scenarios in them um, across both uh, Chang, or the model Chang works on Mural and OpenSEM, the model I work on. Um, Across those across those scenarios for different years, I guess there's probably there's a couple of key points to draw out. So this this is a you know the four scenarios. The pluses are the exports, um, yeah, time along the x-axis, and then yeah the, the so mural results on one side and and the open sem results on the other side. I guess one of the key key results I think um, is that the energy system will end up being dominated by wind and solar from an energy perspective in, in all of those scenarios. Um, you know, we see, yeah, and th this is, uh, I guess, unsurprising if you look at the cost of, um, the cost of these technologies, um, uh, you know, at the moment and the projections for these technologies. Um, what is, I guess, less consistent across the models and, and very much driven by different modeling approaches and different, um, uh, different input assumptions is what, we do use to firm that, 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 that renewable energy resource, that is provide a reliable power system. Um, essentially across the three models, that there was, and this was very much reflective of input assumptions um, and, and modeling approaches that the Muriel model tended to have more um, um, pumped hydro. Uh, our model had a mix of pumped hydro and concentrating solar thermal and the um, remix model tended to have a mix of, uh, have, have a lithium ion dominated system. Um, so that's, that's a, I think, in itself a, an interesting observation is that, ra ra relatively speaking, the energy um, in input, the megawatt hours, is fairly consistent across, uh, across the scenarios. But what we use, what the other stuff is, is actually, there's a lot of different, a lot of different options there and, a, and it very much depends on what, what the, um, the assumptions are around, you know, things like reliability, um, technology costs and, and so on for those particular technologies. The other, the other, I think, key observation here is um, that that system that I talk about, that 
dominated by renewable energy with things like pumped hydro and solar thermal and lithium ion and demand response and all of that. That is actually going to happen in, in this, um, you know, scenario one, the business as usual scenario, admittedly, certainly now uh, we still end up having a bit more coal. Um, so, but it's it sort of, in, in my mind, the way I think about this is the end point is not really the, it's less interesting now, it's actually the speed in which we get there. Um, and, and that is, I guess, the, the key, yeah, the key, um, the key trend across all scenarios is eventually we end up with a very much a renewable energy dominated system, um, but re how fast we get there is very much dependent on your assumptions around how fast we decarbonize and what, um, you know, yeah, what our, what we try, what we do with the export. Um, oh, that, that tends to, you know, we'll talk about that in a minute, that doesn't actually tend to, to change the mix too much, but it does just change the overall um, uh, amount of generation. Um, so in terms of, th this is also an interesting, uh, an interesting, um, I guess, finding as well. And this, this one has to be interpreted with some degree of caution, um, is the different system costs across the, the different uh, models. Um, so we have the, the, there's essentially, as we, as we um, increase the level of decarbonisation and um, ambition, there is a, an increase in overall system costs, a, a very small increase in overall system costs. Should, uh, even though they're not directly comparable, it's, it's worth noting that wholesale electricity prices in Australia at the moment are in uh, the 90 to $100 range. Um, but what I think is particularly interesting is as we go further beyond that and start using um, particularly hydrogen electrolyzers and um, then those costs actually start to fall. Those system, those total overall system costs start to fall. Um, and yeah, that, that is seen in both the leadership scenario with those, the, the use of hydrogen electrolyzers and, um, and the export scenarios, you actually see very significant declines in overall system costs. The reason that needs to be um, converted to, or treated with caution is that that doesn't mean wholesale electricity prices that you and I pay are going to be cheap. It's a kind of anal analogous to what we currently do with, say, the aluminium smelters. The aluminium smelters down in Victoria, I think, have a, a wholesale contract. Oh, well, the Portland one, I think, has a whole wholesale contract in the vicinity of sixty to eighty dollars a megawatt hour. They get the, the reason they, I guess, exist is because they have a a, a a contract that's at a lower price than the rest of the market. And it'd be you would envision a similar thing that if well, there's two ways to think about this. You can either sell cheap hydrogen, in which case you're using cheap resources to do that, or you can sell hydrogen that's, I guess, or you can smear the cost across the entire system, um, and which everyone gets it gets cheap cheap energy so it's it's yeah it, it's a kind of it, the overall system costs for looking at these scenarios do decline and they are that is an interesting finding but if you start taking out the fact that we're we're essentially assuming that all the cheap energy goes into into a hydrogen electrolyzer then this is a bit of a um it needs to be treated with caution anyway um uh, yeah, this just a highlighting that, that essentially the the uh, what the uh, impact of those hydrolysis does to these um, to the to those overall system costs. Um, and this this is a, taking this even further. This is um, um, yeah, I, th I think this was this was Cheng's work. I think um, basically instead of going to two hundred percent, going out to four hundred percent. And this is um, I think this is an important you know th there are in increasing there are marginal returns in, in terms of re reducing system costs um, but they diminish as, as you go and you may end up getting to a this is not necessarily a, a, a good way to think about this but um, you could think about this as the the I, I, you, you could use this result to inform a cost curve for hydrogen is what I, I guess I'm saying is at some point in the future you will reach a an equilibrium um, sort of price in electricity prices where the addition of another um, unit of a hydrogen electrolyzer will essentially, you know, it will need to be balanced by whatever is going into that. And that's essentially what that, that, um, that partly, well, that's, that's what this diagram shows. There is a benefit, there is absolutely a benefit to system costs um, um, for having electrolyzers. How those are allocated between the hydrogen and the rest of the economy is, is, is very much a, an open question. Um, 
Ah, oh, yes, that's that was the um, the endpoint. This is a this is showing the results, and this is I think this is a, a particular result that shows that particularly shows um, this concept of what electrolyzers do really depends on um, you know what's going into them. Um, and in this case, you can see that you know if you if you cut off this this sort of peak here, you've got a, a sort of normal electricity system, and essentially the electrolyzer loads are soaking up solar PV. So they, they are um, they are using very. It's also worth pointing out in this in the remix model they tended to have lower solar PV costs than um, both OpenSEM and Mural, and they had higher uh, sorry lower um, uh, yeah lower um, lithium ion costs as well. But if you if you have a look at that, that part of the uh, part of the system, that's sort of what you see when you're looking looking at things like the integrated system plan from AEMO, where you have a, a, a bit of a balance, a bit of a, a mix between wind and solar and storage. Um, but if you've got really cheap electrolyzers from a capital point of view that can use really cheap, that are flexible and you can soak up solar, then you just build a hell, hell of a lot of solar. So that, it's a sort of a, it's a bit of a result, uh, an assumption driven result, but it's an interesting one in that it's, um, it's sort of showing, uh, I guess, yeah, what, what is potentially there, um, potentially uh, achievable with um, electrolyzers and, and in providing this, um, um, yeah, added input or and also a, a yeah a sponge, a solar sponge, as people are, have have um, referred to to the rest of the system because they can actually, I guess, in when we are talking about you know reliability events when we don't have enough um, generation, it would be you know if it was a cloudy day, you wouldn't be doing that to your electrolyzers. Um, so th there is, I guess, a marginal value to the re reliability of the power system for having all of this flexibility there on the demand side. Um, anyway, uh, that's probably the, the, the key results we wanted to talk to. And, you know, this is a great um, vision and um, concept, but there needs to be essentially some kind of coordinated um, uh, process for you know, for that to actually happen, and it's a very much a chicken and egg kind of problem as well, because there is not really a very large demand for hydrogen at the moment. There's um, you know, there's ideas of using you know, but you know, it's not it's not um, it's you can't go out to the market and you know buy a, a huge amount of hydrogen right now. Um, and so there's no there's no there's a there's a yeah there's a chicken and egg problem between people in say Japan or Germany or Korea who might want to buy German um, you know green hydrogen, um, but there's no one selling it, and at the moment there's no one who might want to buy our green hydrogen either. So we do have a bit of a um, um, a challenge there. But yeah, there's lots of opportunities there. Um, sort of this sort of relates to the slide I showed earlier in terms of why Germany and Australia and what what the, the synergies are there. But there definitely does need to be some kind of um, if, if this is a you know a, a, a vision and an idea that we want to embrace as a country, then there's a fair bit of coordination and um, uh, that, that need, and research and all sorts of other things that need to happen for that to become a reality. Um, and there's another. Uh, energy transition hub around some of those issues around the um, export opportunities as well. But um, I think that's it, and hopefully we've got plenty of time for questions. Thank you so much to um, Chung and Dylan. And one benefit we have for our online viewers that are currently at the computer um, we have this yellow brochure on energytransitionhub.org and if you there go to the publication, you will have a great brochure with all the background material. Um, for our people in the auditorium and especially our long-term um, uh, participants, what is the great benefit we give you today and from today on every seminar? You didn't notice? <laughs> you did not notice? We went through gate lens to get such a nice crystal clear um, projector <laughs> before it was always blurry. So from now on, our seminars are not crystal clear, not only crystal clear in content, but also in presentation. So um, I open the floor to questions. Thank you. Um, Patricia Boyce, Seed Advisory. Um, last time 
I saw presentations on renewable hydro, which is now some time ago, going back nearly 10 years from CSIRO. The issue with renewable hydrogen was that the effective capital costs of an interrupt of interrupted performance were really very significant. And unless you managed to extend the performance of the hydrolyzer, then it was not remotely competitive. What's changed? Um, I'm really annoyed. I was going to have a, an additional slide on exactly this question. Um, I, if I get a chance, I can show it to you um, later on. So one, one thing that's changed is, well, one, the capital cost of um, uh, the, the technology, there's two, there's a couple of different technologies. So the, the one that we're sort of, uh, yeah, anyway, there's a bit of a uh, technology dependence there, but there's also, um, the, the chart I wanted to show you is actually, a lot of the assumptions are, so the, this is very much, very much an issue in the German context that you have, to, if you have electrolyzers, you want to be running them at full load hours and with no interruption, right? Um, but that's very much predicated about what, you know, in terms of what you put in, in terms of your assumptions around electricity price cost. Now, if you're going from a, an average cost perspective, that's, um, you're going to get a particular result, right? If, you, if you're assuming you're, you're going to get $60 a megawatt hour, then of course. Super marginal cost of yes. To zero. Yes. Now, if you think, look, so this is the, the slide and the diagram I was going to show you. We looked at this for South Australia. If you assume that the last, um, the lowest 20% of prices, if you say you're happy with, you know, 20% full load hours, say 30% full load hours, if you look at that, what, what, what is the average price in South Australia with for the lowest 30% of times? It's actually, last time I checked, it was about $26 a megawatt hour. Now, if you're getting, if you're happy to pay $26 a megawatt hour, then the, the economics of your electrolyzer dramatically change. Um, so if you're, you know, if you've got a, if you're happy to, you know, it, it, essentially you go from a system, an electrolyzer that is dominated by capital costs um, and low fuel costs, low marginal costs, to a system to or at the other end of the spectrum, you have an electrolyzer that runs at high full load hours that's dominated by your energy costs. And yeah, that, that, you know, this, this curve that for, for Australia, for South Australia in particular, there is essentially a big flat optimal point, depending on your assumptions, that actually sits in the sort of, I think it's about the 20 to 50% range. If you go to full load highs, hours above that, yeah, sure, that's great for your, you know, paying off your capital, but you're paying a premium for your electricity. If you go to the other end, if you go to less than say 10% or you, then sure you're not paying much for electricity, but your capital payments are. Um, yeah. So that's part of what's, what's different is actually thinking about how that um, steps in, uh, you know, works in the system. But the other thing that is different is the capital costs have also um, come down. Yeah, so in our optimization, we found actually in the early days when the electrolysis are very expensive, we tend to locate as a, a place with best wind and solar to maximize the capacity factor. But later in 2000, actually the capacity factor around 35% only because only, you know, uh, take the solar peaks when the electrodes are, are getting more and more cheaper. Hello, thanks for your presentation. Um, I'm Kate Noble from the City of Melbourne. Uh, my question is, uh, your analysis is looking NEM-wide and Australia economy-wide. I'm interested in um, how your analysis might map to um, regional-based transition planning. I was thinking of the smart specialisation strategy that the Australian German Energy College is also involved with the Gippsland um, and in particular um, you know do you have data sets or is there work underway looking at some of that place-based transition I'm thinking of LNG in Gippsland for example. Mm -hmm. um, it's a tough question um, <laughs> um, that's all right um, oh, the tough question in that I, I don't have a good answer for you I guess um, <laughs> um, I mean so that I would say that the the location of some of these some of these findings is very I mean it's very high level like you know for our model we look at 25 to 30 nodes in the NEM there's probably only a handful in Victoria so the, the results are you know you know sort of Western Victoria versus um, you know Latrobe Valley versus Central Victoria etc so they're, they're probably 
depending on what you're interested in, they're probably not at the scale that you're interested in. Um, and then I, I think the other thing that um, then comes, um, it's essentially like, yeah, um, things that are completely unrelated to this, like, um, I mean, you might be familiar with the Star of the South project, for example, like that's not something that an economic optimization kind of exercise like this. So Star of the South is a, um, an offshore wind project in, in off the Latrobe Valley um, in the sort of oil fields region. Now, if you put that into the, this model, I haven't done it. It's actually something I'm really keen to do. It may, I, I suspect it's, um, it won't be, it wouldn't be an economically optimal solution, but that fails to take into account a whole heap of other transitional issues that are, you know, the fact that you have a workforce down there that works in the offshore um, oil and gas sector, the fact that you have um, a fairly economically depressed area in the Latrobe Valley, there's all these sort of political economy reasons that that project, from my perspective, makes a hell of a lot of sense. And that's going to be completely ignored by this sort of analysis. So, yeah, I'd be careful of, I mean, this is yeah, very, I guess, high level, I guess, and I'd be careful of downscaling that to a particular region in Victoria. But one additional point that I'm tempted to make, in the Latrobe Valley, you have the brown coal um, hydrogen reforming um, project. And um, on a big picture perspective, whether that is the right way to go um, in order to market Australia and the world as a green hydrogen um, producer, that is questionable. And I think so much on these new technology and the developments depends on the public license. If the Europeans see Australia not only via the headline statements of what the ministers on the federal level, etc., say, but also that actually hydrogen from Australia comes from brown coal, it's dead. And that is the same as with the German bioethanol debate, etc., and it has a very different course versus, for example, Scandinavia, where you have high portions of bioethanol and there can be sustainable bioethanol, but because of these entry points into the public discussion and how they were set and what the dominant topics were, it took a completely different course and bioethanol, you don't get it at the petrol stations anymore in Germany. And that is really these vote forks are so important. And therefore, I would say that um, having the brown coal hydrogen plant in the Latrobe Valley, from my perspective, can be assured in their own foot. Yeah, you know, um, I'll just add a point. In our study, actually, although it's high level, but we found actually Gippsland really attractive in terms of renewables because it has very, very uh, high, high existing transmission capacity there. So in the early days of energy transition, this place definitely be a very well positioned. Very good point. And now we go here, then here. All right. You can hear me, Simon Coburn, Master of Energy, uh, or Master of Energy Systems student at University of Melbourne. Dylan's one of my lecturers. Uh, so is Malta. Uh, my, so I'm a total fan. I've been to you know a lot of these presentations, and for me, this is a no-brainer. I'm changing careers to throw my shoulder to the wheel. So I'm not trying to throw a wet blanket over this, but I'm curious about the, the assumptions you've made in the four models about the deplo the the ability to do the transition, the speed of transition. And can I name some sort of factors? We've got a lot of capital equipment to bring into the country. We're competing on a global market. We need access to private and public capital. We've got to build a lot of transmission. Uh, uh, there's access to land. You know, you know all these things, these factors. And a, an example we've been taught on the course is, you know, oil was discovered in 1859. It took 50 years to capture 5% of the world's energy market. So I'm trying to chuck a wet blanket. What assumptions have you made about how quickly you can do this, um, especially with 2050 as an horizon? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question, and it's an, it's I, I would answer that by saying it's essentially beyond scope of what this does. But it's something that's um, just because of the nature of this least cost optimization, and it's a complete and it's a limitation I'm aware of. It's limit. You know, AMO does this in in their um, uses that for their ISP. They're actually looking at this particular question. Um, uh, of like what are the actual uh, constraints on you know how fast we can actually do this and it, it's a very big question because it's not actually only about you know we're, we're competing on a global stage for capital we're competing um, for labor um, you know if you if you started doing some of these aggressive scenarios where you're you know rolling out th that that will have a 
substantial impact on probably the cost of them because prices will start going up for you know labor and 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 there's all sorts of there's all sorts of issues with land access for transmission and um and or, you know the, these you know kilometer square arrays of solar like they're they're, they're huge questions that I'd love to, you know, think about more and do more work on, but that's essentially not what this exercise was was looking at. So it's a bit of a cop-out answer, but it's uh, it's not um, not something I'm uh, ignoring entirely. Um, my name is James Gaffey, and um, I'm, uh, one of the earlier slides um, that I saw uh, referred to um, one of the, the cost issues as being um, whether you used uh, uh, surface or groundwater or um, uh, desalinated water. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit in, in um, uh, terms of what sort of a uh, um, differential it makes to the economic viability of the system? The major difference is the location for Central Northern Territory because for some, for some start from the geo, geo, geo I, I, I don't know, the, sorry, I forgot, I couldn't recall the name from the German agency. Look at that, actually there are good um, uh, online, I mean, groundwater resources, even in Central Northern Territory around the um, um, Alice Spring. I was pretty surprised. But actually, hydrogen doesn't consume that a, a lot of water that people think actually even to replant to replay the LNG. So, but this but use groundwater is not sustainable. In some of our study, if you, if you, if we can use groundwater actually, if that study uh, uh, is good, but actually the Central Northern Territory the best location for for hydrogen production because you have the best solar resources and best wind resources. You can maximize, you know, the electrolysis uh, um, capacity factor, the highest capacity factor. But if you can't use the uh, water resources there, if you want to use desalinated water, which is you have to bring all the, those electricity generation to the, to the coastal lines by means of HVDC, like 1,000 kilometers. But when you have this kind of constraint, you, you know, water constraint, and use HVDC to bridge the electricity into the culture, but actually the Central Northern Territory might not be good location for hydrogen production. So this is the difference when you have all those uh, constraints and assumptions. So we have Scott next, and then we go to a question online. Uh, thanks, guys. Really great stuff, by, by the way, and um, terrific you're doing this work. Um, I suppose one of the key questions is the role of storage over this next 30 years. Um, and, and in particular, if you wouldn't mind commenting on pumped hydro, and there's a lot of talk about Snowy 2.0 at the moment, and the role or otherwise that Snowy 2.0 might have in these scenarios. Um, I'm happy to talk about Snowy 2.0 in a it's completely unrelated to this, <laughs> um, but uh, this is, I mean, this is very much, uh, yeah, uh, where the assumptions around what, what you think is feasible or possible um, becomes important. Um, so, you know, you have this sort of Andrew Blaker's um, work that's out there that's, you know, there's 22,000 sites available and, you know, if you start looking, you know, I mean, you know, as a, a, re a real world example, um, Taz Hydro is, you know, they, they, they did this for Tasmania, they came up with very similar numbers to them. They start, you know, sharpening their pencils and all of a sudden they're down to three, right? Like it's not, you know, the, yes, there is theoretically potential for a crap load of soul, um, pumped hydro, but when you start looking at, you know, a whole heap of other factors that, like if you just, you know, not, that's not to be disparaging to their work, there is a lot of opportunity out there for doing pumped hydro, but there are some real world constraints um, about about building it and I think actually one of the biggest one of the problems I mean this is not a problem that's specific to pump hydro or an issue that's specific to pump hydro is actually building big things um, so that that's you know it's a big project um, whether whether it was a big um, you know a big solar thermal plant or a big pump hydro plant or a big coal plant or a big nuclear plant that is a really hard thing to do in a liberalized democracy today um, that's one of the sort of sneaky 
advantages of, of the modular technologies like um, wind and solar. You can do little parcels, little projects, um, sort of in, in a very, uh, uh, yeah, in a much more, you know, doing those, those big projects at long lead times, have lots of community opposition, um, but they are, they are hard to build. So I think there are some assumptions around, you know, even sort of um, somewhat famously now that the pump, the Snowy 2.0 project has, its timeline has blown out significantly, its costs have blown out significantly. Um, and so that, that's why I think it's that, that, that question around what the role, I think, you know, storage is going to have a big role. There's no question about that. What the makeup of that storage is um, and how that happens, that is a very wide open field in my mind. Um, and there's lots of contenders, contenders in there. But I, I think it's a, it, it is certainly a, the most mature of the technologies, um, and it's got some of the some really good characteristics, but it's also got some really big challenges. We have, in, due to time, we have two more questions um, here online, uh, and then one from the auditorium, and then I'm sure that the modelers are available also for further questions here. Yeah, just I'll yeah. just. Oh, <laughs> oh okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we've got a couple of uh, online questions here, so we'll get through only two of those, unfortunately. So, Open uh, CEM uses 2018 ISP assumptions. 2019 ISP assumptions are already published and are quite different from 2018. Do you have any plans to update your modelling with the 2019 assumptions? Yes. <laughs> That's what I like. <laughs> uh, we'll take a second one then. Uh, so, in the, a second online question. Hopefully the uh, answer is just as brief. In the context of negative pricing events in South Australia and Queensland during high renewable energy output already, how do we get there with market-based in, uh, incentives drying up? Are further government incentives necessary to get there? That's a very good question. Um, uh, so the negative price, I, my, my perspective on that is, um, I mean, this, this is, this, this, we're sort of at a, a place right now where we're in a mix between a, um, a market-based um, system and a, a more centrally controlled system. Um, we've definitely moved very much towards, there's much more government intervention and, and involvement in the last three plus years. Um, and so I guess the answer to that question depends on whether you think we should have a market-based system or whether you, we should go down a centrally planned, coordinated, or, or more, um, a more planned, uh, um, approach. Um, that's, that's a, I guess, a political question. Um, in the current setting, if you think that the current market framework will continue, then what you would like to see happen, what I would like to see happen, or what, you know, in theory should happen, is you would start seeing things like loads changing their behaviour to reflect negative pricing. You see uh, basically a demand side response, but you also see other projects being built that aren't solar projects. And that's part of the problem of I mean, I guess some of our incentive schemes and the, I mean, it's great that they've gone in, but we, we, we need things that aren't solar and wind. Um, so those things might be start, like things like storage. I um, mean, we've got the, the Gen X project um, up in, in, it's a pump tidal project up in there. And that's actually made more viable by the fact that there's negative prices during the day and, and, and um, you, know, ex, you know, expensive prices during the evening peak. So, if you left it to the market, and you you know um, you know it's it'll it'll probably would probably get there, but it's a question about like the speed. Oh, the, you know the other thing is we're seeing wind farms being built in Queensland because they don't have a solar profile. Um, you know, so that that's it's not necessarily a bad thing, I don't think. Um, but it's a there's a bigger question about how should the system be organised and how fast that should happen. That, that's yeah, that's a, more of a political question. Well, hello, uh, Lin Shi from a uh, postdoc from University of Melbourne. Uh, so basically, um, my background is a power power system. I'm looking at uh, one of the figure you post about this generation and load profile, and I found something like renewable penetration level in this case will be something I think over ninety percent or something. Yeah. And I mean, based on my knowledge currently, like say, uh, for renewable penetration level over sixty, it will already be quite challenging to manage it. So. Do you have any fundamental, like say, underlying assumption on this? Is how we achieve it, or uh, maybe we we'll got it short cost for managing this kind of system? Okay, are you talking about sort of things like, um, uh, yeah, frequency control and inertia yeah, I mean, and things like that? Or, uh, I mean, generally speaking, let's say ancillary services, or I mean, if you just got this small about conventional generator in mm -hmm. the system, how would this happening? Or? So, so there's a. 
in in our so for things like synchronous generation, we have constraints in there to make make, make sure that there are minimum levels of okay. synchronous generation. Um, so that and that, that there are lots of renewable technologies that provide that. Um, so um, it's concentrating soil thermal, um, hydro, biomass, hydro. They okay. all they all provide those traditional um, services, and okay. it's a matter of what what level that needs to be at. Um, is, is an open question, but we do constrain our models to okay. make sure that that is possible. Um, and we use the same reliability metrics okay. that the, the system operator uses, unserved energy, keeping unserved energy within a certain, um, you know, a certain threshold. Um, and that's, um, that's actually an interesting question because if you start changing what we accept as a society as reliability or, you know, how, much, how reliable we want our power system, that actually has a significant effect on what the you know, the last mile cost. So, um, but yeah, it's taken, it's certainly taken into account, um, but yeah. In this optimization model actually found is, is favorable for electrolysis to be integrated into the national electricity market, which can perform like a sort of demand response. So in the future, I believe in future energy system, it, it will be, uh, it will be really highly flexible. Although comparing our uh, leadership and leadership plus export scenarios, we don't see massive increase for uh, for transmission expansion, also storage, because we have electrolysis there to as, as demand response because it can because the pumps can operate really flexible. Just because you mentioned sixty percent, guess what the renewable energy average record week was in Germany, and how much percent of renewable energy there was in the system? Is the average throughout the week? Twenty um, percent. <laughs> <20%. laughs> yes. Okay. Then think about what was renewable energy week record in South Australia this year. How many percent of renewable energies? No, for the week average, it was also 60%. Anyway, um, uh, join me in thanking our speakers today. And we have one more seminar coming up tomorrow. Um, uh, from 12.30 to 1.30. It's not here. It's over in the Building for Sustainable Design, the Glenn Davis Building. It's averting climate catastrophe, extinction rebellion, business and people and power from Professor Neil Gunningham from the Australian National University. So look on our website, the Climate Energy College. There, go to the seminars. You will find the location. And again, if you're interested in the Energy Transition Hub work, there's a whole range of brief, nicely, easily understandable um, publications on our publications page on the Energy Transition Hub. Thank you very much today and hope to see you soon again.